So if you uh, have your Bible, open a Bible with me to Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 14 through 22. Uh, we welcome those of you who are watching online and want to remind you that this will be our last Wednesday Bible study until August as we, during the summer, will have different activities, but we will not be meeting here at the church. Uh, I want to remind you of that. Uh, but tonight, we're going to look at the final uh, lesson uh, on the s seven letters to the seven churches. It's kind of as a way of review. Uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ wrote these letters, very personal letters, uh, to seven specific churches that were congregations for real, just like us. Real people, real setting, historical. Uh, but the number seven is a significant number. It's the number of completeness, wholeness. Uh, the number seven, we think about Jesus created the world in seven days. It was finished. It was complete. There are seven days in a week. That week is finished. And, and so the, the number seven represents all churches. These churches were representatives and examples of churches throughout all the ages. And even though they were specific congregations, we can find application in every one of these letters to us today. And so the first letter was to the letter to the church of Ephesus. That was a church that had heart problems, remember? Uh, they had a lot of good works, but they had lost their first love. And because of that, Jesus said, if you don't repent and return to me, I will take your lampstand out. I'll put your light out. Then the church at Smyrna was a church that had true riches. The, the, church, the, the city and the church was going through poverty, but they had spiritual riches. So this was a letter of encouragement. The church at Pergamos was a church that had moral issues. This was the church that lived at Satan's back door. And so they had some issues going on in their church that needed to be corrected. The church at Thyatira was the church with tolerant doctrine. They, they let the, that uh, prophet that was Jezebel lead people into sexual immorality. And that was a very strong letter that speaks to our day of this whole idea of tolerance with sin. And Jesus rebuked that. Uh, the church at Sardis was a church with a past reputation, remember? They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead, like so many people that live on a past reputation, talk about the glory days instead of the day that they're living in now being your best days for Christ. The church at Philadelphia we looked at last week was a church that had great opportunities. God said, you've got a little bit of faith, you've got a little bit of strength, so I'm going to open doors of opportunity for you. And so tonight, we're going to finish with the church of Laodicea. Uh, this was a church with a lukewarm commitment to Christ. You know, it's not uncommon for people today to profess faith in Christ, but to not take it very seriously. They profess faith, but they don't really take that commitment to Christ very serious. A lot of professing Christians like to straddle the fence in their devotion to the Lord, right? You know what it means to straddle the fence, right? It means to have one foot on one side and one foot on the other. And that is the problem in the church today. So many people want to put one foot in the church on Sunday and dress up and look all Christian, but then on Monday they put their foot in the world and they dress up and act like the world for the rest of the week. And that kind of Christianity doesn't cut it. That's not what Jesus Christ is looking for. And I think, what Je I think what Jesus would say to us in the message tonight is, is that if you're straddling the fence, you need to get on one side or the other. <laughs> you know, you need to make up your mind and get on one side of the fence or the other. If you're, if you're a Christian, if you want to follow Jesus, then you need to be all in. And if you're not, then you need to be all out. Don't pretend to be something that you're not. As the old pop rock song used to say, I think it was by the Doobie Brothers, some of you will remember this song, Jesus is just alright with me. You know, that song always hit me the wrong way. Some people thought it was great. Oh, wow, the Doobie Brothers singing about Jesus. And I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, Jesus is not just alright with you, alright? Either you... Either He's your Lord and you bow down to Him and you worship Him 
or he's nothing. You know, this Jesus is my buddy, this is all right with me, doesn't cut it. And this sums up the depth of many people's commitment to Christ. Oh yeah, Jesus is all right with me, I think Jesus is cool. No, no, you don't understand who Jesus is if you can make a statement like that. Uh, Jesus is holy, holy, holy. He is the Lord. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He died on a cross for our sins, and we must never take our commitment to Christ lightly. Uh, in our text, Jesus wrote this letter to the church at Laodicea, and He rebuked them severely for their lukewarm faith. They, they had a lukewarm faith. They had that fence-straddling kind of commitment. Jesus was just all right with them. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the city of Laodicea. Uh, it was a wealthy inland city, about 40 miles from Philadelphia in the Lycus River Valley. Uh, it was a city that was steeped in Greek culture and learning. It was a thriving city of industry. So this would have been like a mountain brook or a Hollywood. I mean, it was a, it was a city that was uh, really known for being a wealthy city. It was at the crossroads of three main roadways, and that's what made it a city of industry. Three major roadways uh, convened, and that, that helped Laodicea to become one of the wealthiest commercial centers in the ancient world. So... Unlike Smyrna, you remember we talked about that city, how impoverished they were. Laodicea was elite. Laodicea became known for its industry and banking. And so in the ancient world, they, were, they, they had banking centers. They were known for their wool. They were renowned for that. And also their medicine. Uh, doctors are usually in wealthy cities. And so they were known for their medicine, especially their eye salve, that was a, a remedy for healing. So when you think about the city itself, the church in that city, you know, kind of took on the, the character of the city, and that will be in the tone of the letter that Jesus wrote to them. So the main idea I want to share with you as we look at this letter is that lukewarm commitment is nauseating to Christ. Lukewarm commitment is nauseating to Christ. And that is coming right out of our text. You might say that it's better for somebody to be lukewarm than to be lost. Not according to Jesus. Uh, we're going to see that uh, he, he, he doesn't like lukewarmness. Uh, and it's almost better to be lost because then there's hope for you to be saved. But if you're lukewarm, you often think, well, Jesus is just all right with me, right? I'm good. So, so let's, let's read this strong letter of rebuke from Jesus. Uh, Begin with verse 14, Luke, uh, Revelation 3. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen. Amen is a word that means true. <laughs> so I'm about to share truth with you. The faithful and true witness. The beginning of God's creation. So that's Jesus. He's the amen. He's the faithful and true witness. He's the beginning of God's creation. Jesus said, I know your works. Now he has nothing good to say. Now most letters, remember, had a word of con commendation and then a, a rebuke, a letter of condemnation. But Jesus has nothing to say good about this church. He said, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I would that you would either be cold or hot. So Jesus said, I'd rather you be cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's a literally Greek strong word that, that kind of means vomit. I will vomit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing, here's what Jesus said, that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. 
so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may be clothed from the shame of your nakedness and it may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquer and sit down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Our Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to our hearts from this letter that you wrote tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, lukewarm commitment is nauseating to Christ, right? I mean, you can't miss that point. I mean, that's the main point right there in the heart of this letter. And so there are three things I want you to notice with me as we think about the church of Laodicea. Number one is notice with me the sad condition of the church. The sad condition. This was a church that Jesus described as lukewarm, half-hearted, high-minded, but half-hearted. Uh, they, in verse 14, He said, I am the true witness. I'm going to be truthful with you. I'm going to be straight with you. I'm going to cut it straight. And, and here's what I love about Jesus Christ as the man that was loving and kind and compassionate. He was truthful. He spoke the truth in love. And, and we've kind of lost the concept of that in society today. The idea today is if you love me, you're going to agree with me. And that, that doesn't fly when it comes to Jesus. He, he loved, but He didn't agree with you unless He did agree with you. If He didn't agree with you, He told you. He said, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth in love. And so many believers... We, we've gotten shy. We're afraid to teach the truth in love. We're afraid to say what the truth is because we're afraid that we'll be offending somebody or we're not being tolerant. But that, that kind of tolerance is not biblical. Where tolerance means I disagree with you, but I can still love you. That kind of tolerance I'm, I'm all good with. I can disagree with you and love you. But the kind of tolerance the world is trying to force on us today is a tolerance that says, you don't have the right to disagree with me. And I cert most certainly do have the right. And, and really, I love you if I speak truth to you. That's love. I don't love you if I lie to you and tell you, yeah, yeah, okay, you're okay. That's, that's not love. Love is speaking the truth. Jesus is the ultimate truth teller. And He's going to tell the truth. And, and he said this, he said, I know your works, you're neither hot or cold. I, I wish you were one or the other, he says. And because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You know, I, I can identify with that. I don't like things that are lukewarm. I mean, when I brush my teeth, every now and then I forget to turn off the warm water. You know, and, and you, when you rinse out that, you, you get that lukewarm, ah, uh, you know, and you're just like, oh, you know, you want cold water. Well, on the other hand, when I go get coffee, I like my coffee to be hot. I mean, when they serve it to me, it's lukewarm. I want to take it back and say, look, my coffee needs to be hot. I, you don't want things lukewarm. You either want it to be cold or you want it to be hot. And that comes especially with our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in verse 17, you say, I'm rich. Okay, they were, they were a wealthy church. This was a church in Mountain Brook. I mean, this was a church in a very affluent city. They probably had money that other churches didn't have. They probably had bells and whistles that other churches didn't have. I mean, they, they had money. And you say that you have prospered and that you don't need anything. Other churches needed offerings from other people. They, they were self-sufficient. You do not realize... Now here's what Jesus said. You're wretched. So their lukewarmness led them to be wretched. That means sinful, pitiable. They're to be pitied. They're poor, spiritually poor. They were wealthy, 
but they were spiritually poor. You know, when we have kids like that, that means that we as a church are wealthy, right? I love a noisy church. Now, I don't ever complain about noisy churches. How terrible would it be not to have kids screaming in your hallway, right? That would be to be poor. So we love that. Uh, blind, he said, you're blind. And he said, you're naked. You're naked. Your sin is exposed. So boy, those are, those are strong words. Now remember in Revelation 2 verse 9, when Jesus was writing to the church at Smyrna, He said, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. So here was a church that was going through persecution, and they were, they were going through great poverty. But Jesus said, you're rich. You're spiritually rich. You are where you need to be. So there is a big difference between physical, material wealth and spiritual wealth. And you want the latter. You want spiritual wealth. Proverbs 13, 7 says, There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. And one who makes himself poor, but has great riches. Luke 18, 11, The Pharisee and the rich man were praying. The, or the Pharisee and the, and the poor man were praying, and the Pharisee stood and prayed thus, God, I thank you, I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even this tax collector. And Jesus said, you're not who you think you are. And so the sad condition of the church was they were wretched and they didn't know it. They were poor and they didn't know it. John Stott, in his commentary, said perhaps none of the seven letters is more appropriate to the 20th century church than this. It describes vividly the respectable, sentimental, nominal, skin-deep religious religiosity which is so widespread among us today. Our Christianity has become flabby and anemic. We, we appear to have taken a lukewarm bath of religion. Whoa. Powerful. Apathy and Christianity do not mix. And so the sad condition of the church, half-hearted, high-minded, but nauseating. Notice the serious counsel to the church. Here's what Jesus said to them. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. So they, they, they had a need for true riches. True riches. True riches are the riches that come from an intimate relationship with God. You, you can't get those riches by material things. Money can buy a lot of things. Money can buy a big house. But money cannot buy a home. Money can buy lots of possessions, but money cannot buy peace. Money can buy elaborate jewelry, but money cannot provide joy. How many people do we know have all these things but no joy? Who is the only one that can give us joy? Jesus. Who's the only one that can give us true peace? Jesus Christ. Who's the only one that can truly give us a home? A, a real home? Jesus Christ. And so, money is not the true riches. Jesus is. And Jesus said, if you want true riches, then you have to get those from me. He said, so I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may be clothed. So they had a need not only for true riches, they had a need for true righteousness. They, they didn't have true righteousness. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, We are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is like filthy rags in the eyes of God. And so, religiosity and attending a high-minded church and having a lukewarm commitment to Christ, those things are not going to give you righteousness. Who is the only one that can give you righteousness? Jesus. And so when, when we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, 
We are clothed with a robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ gives. And it covers all our guilty stains. All of our sin is covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But without Him, you can try to be as righteous as you want to be, like the Pharisee who said, I'm glad I'm not like that tax collector. But all Jesus sees is your unrighteousness. He doesn't see what you think is your righteousness. So this church needed the, the righteousness that can only come from Jesus Christ. And then the third thing they needed was true revelation. He said, um, you do not real." He said, uh, I counsel you to anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you may see. Now remember, the city was known for its medicine. It was, known, it was particularly known for its eye salve. And therefore, Jesus is saying, you know, you may have this ointment you put on your eyes physically, but you're spiritually blind. You can't see. You're spiritually blind. You think you're this, but you're really this. And therefore, he says, you need true revelation. You need to be able to see. In Matthew 19, 23-24, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it, easy, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Do you realize that prosperity is not often the friend of the church? It's not often the friend of the church. And I think America, the church in America has become weak because we have been prosperous. And we, we forgot how much we need the Lord, how dependent that we are on the Lord. Jesus went on to say that all things are possible with God. And so, can people that are wealthy have a passionate love for Jesus? Absolutely. But it's rare. It's rare. I mean, look at the elite of the world. Look at Hollywood. Look at the rich and the famous. How many of them are true lovers of Jesus? You can probably count them on your hand, the ones they even claim to be. Most of them don't even claim to be. And the ones that claim to be, sometimes you, you look at the fruit of their life and you're like, you know, I don't know. And, and, and so right after the rich man turned away from Jesus, Lazarus, who was a rich man, climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, and Jesus went to his house and saved him. And he said, hey, I, well, everything I've stolen, I'm going to give it back fourfold. So can a rich person be saved? Absolutely. Zac Zacchaeus was saved. Jesus said it. But it is more difficult. because it, Why is it more difficult? Not because riches is a sin. It's more difficult because riches can make you think you don't need God. And, and, and that's where so many people are today. And this church had become, yeah. Yeah, God knew. God, God's, God's loving. Warren Wiersbe said, In the Christian life there are three spiritual temperatures. A burning heart on fire with God, a cold heart, a lukewarm heart. The Laodicean church was independent, self-satisfied, and secure. The lukewarm Christian is comfortable, complacent, and does not realize his need. If he were cold, at least he would feel it. As believers in Jesus, we have every reason to be fervent in spirit. To be fervent. The last thing I want you to see is the simple cure for the church. There was a cure for this church. This church could be... Saved. It could be revitalized. It could be redeemed. And Jesus said in verse 19, He said, Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. And that's true. If you're a child of God and you are one that He loves, when we are moving outside of the will of God, He will, he will reprove us and He will discipline us. The first way He reproves us is through the Word of God, the conviction through the Word of God. You don't ever want to lose your sensitivity to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
If you're, if you're listening to someone preach or teach, or you're reading the Bible, and you're like, oh, wow, that, that's convicting. That's a good thing. I mean, that's, that means that your heart is sensitive to God. Conviction is a good thing. If, if you're standing by a fire and you get too close to it, you're going to feel it. You're going to get burned. And you're going to back up. You're going to back up because if you don't, boy, then you could really get burned, right? You could get burns that could be fatal. So the pain that you feel that is when you get close is good. It's a good thing. It's God gave us that so that we would know. That's the way conviction is. When we're moving outside of God's will and the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to convict us and we feel that pain, that's a good thing. Because that way we know if we keep going in that direction, we're going to get burned bad. And so we need to say, we need to adjust. Okay, I feel that conviction. I need to line up with God's Word. Now, if we do not respond to God's conviction, then He disciplines us. And, you know, God is a loving Father. He's not abusive, but He disciplines us. And sometimes His discipline can be painful. I had a loving Father who was not abusive, and He had a really nice belt that He would use on me, and it was painful. I'm honest. It, it hurt, but it was highly effective. It was highly, you know, it, it got me to behave a lot better than I would without that. And, uh, and, and my dad, I never questioned that he loved me. And I never questioned that when he spanked me, that he was abusing me because I deserved it. I knew I deserved it every time he spanked me. And, uh, and I spanked my three boys. You know, I believed in, in that kind of discipline. I never abused them. Uh, God made a perfect part of our body for that. I think that's why he made it, the way it's made. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just the right place to administer the rod, you know. And so I use Mr. Woody. I've heard me talk about Mr. Woody. And we'd always tell our boys, you know, you're going to get Mr. Woody. And uh, they didn't like Mr. Woody. And I didn't have to use Mr. Woody a whole lot because once I had a couple of tastes of Mr. Woody, all I had to say was, you want Mr. Woody? Oh, boy. I mean, it was life-changing. And that's called discipline. It was good. I've got three wonderful boys that are respectful because we provided discipline. And the problem with our world today is they don't, or the generation coming up doesn't want to discipline their children. They've been told by lying psychologists, if you spank them, they're going to be violent. Yeah. I'm like, all right, let's weigh this. All right, our generation of people that we don't spank are the ones walking into grocery stores and shooting people. Back in the days when children were appropriately disciplined, those things didn't happen. And, and so discipline is of God. God disciplines us. And as parents, we need to lovingly discipline our children. I'll be honest with you. When I spank my children... It was one of the most loving, intimate moments because after I spanked them, uh, I would leave the room for a few minutes while they screamed bloody murder. And boy, they did. You thought they were dying. And then I would come back in and I would take them in my arms and I would love them. And boy, they wanted that. They needed that. They wanted that reassurance. And I would tell them how much I love them. And I, I would say, you are way too good of a kid to do what you did. Do you know what you did? Do you know why you got this spanking? Yes, day. And so we'd talk about why they got that spanking. And then I would say, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to pray right now and you're going to ask Jesus to forgive you for being disobedient. And then you're going to go ask your mother or you're going to go talk to your brother that you hit or whatever, whatever they did. So, and they would do that. And it was an amazing moment of love, teaching. So, I say all that. I know this is not a parenting conference, all right? But I say that to say, that's the way God is with us. God disciplines us. And sometimes His discipline may be painful. But when He disciplines us, 
He loves us and He will come to us and show us that He loves us. And, and He will help us to understand what we did wrong and where we were off course. And He will help us to get back on course. That is the way God works. And so he, this is what He was doing in the church of Laodicea. We don't necessarily know how He was reproving them, but He was because He said, those whom I love I reprove and I, I discipline. So he, he was disciplining this church even as he wrote this letter. And he said, be zealous and repent. And, and so the, the thing that he's saying to them is to return to Christ with genuine zeal. Return to Christ with genuine zeal. I love the word zeal. It's good to be zealous. Um, we need more people of faith who are zealous. They're zealous in their worship. They're zealous in their witness. They're zealous in their walk with God. They're zealous in the work that they do. The word zealous means passionate. It, it means that you're not lukewarm, that you are serious about this. And um, that's, that's the most important ingredient that happens when we experience revival. He relights the fire of passion in our hearts for Himself. So the cure was they needed to repent. They needed to turn away from that lukewarm condition and they needed to renew their commitment and, and, and get back that genuine zeal for God. Don't ever let anybody take away your zeal for God. So many people let zeal get stolen by Satan. They get hurt. And it may, they may get hurt in the church by somebody in the church. <clears throat> and they allow that to rob them of their zeal. And I'm like, why would you ever let any human being rob you of the zeal that you have for Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ didn't hurt you. He died for you. So no person should ever be able to rob you of the zeal that you have for Jesus Christ. We don't need to get our eyes on people and individuals. We're all frail creatures of dust. We're all going to make mistakes. There are going to be times that we all might hurt somebody that we really didn't want to hurt because we're human. But that hurt should never rob someone of their zeal for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important to never take our eyes off Jesus. Don't get our eyes on any person. Keep our eyes on Jesus. <clears throat> the second thing he said, the simple cure for the church, not only to return with genuine zeal, but to receive Christ into your heart. You see, beloved, this is the lost church. The church of Laodicea were made up mainly of tares, not wheat. Made up of people who professed faith in Christ, but they did not possess Jesus Christ. And their lukewarmness was the fruit of the fact that the root was bad. The root was not in Christ. And the lukewarmness came from a bad root. And so he says to them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now get this, Jesus is outside of the church. All the other churches, he was in the midst of the lampstands. He's standing outside this church. He's trying to get in. They won't let him in. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and be with him and he with me. And, and, and so Jesus Christ is telling this church to receive Him into their heart. There were many people in this church that needed to be saved. And boy, that, that verse right there is a beautiful verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. That, that, that is a verse of invitation. That, that is Jesus Christ saying to you, I love you and I am knocking at your door. And if you will open that door, I will come in and I will be with you and you'll be with me. 
And, and I cherish that. There was a, a painter who um, painted this picture. His name was William Holman Hunt. It's a famous painting called Jesus at the Door. And the, the thing that stands out about the painting, it's Jesus, there's a door, he's knocking on the door. And the thing that is interesting is there's no doorknob on the outside of the door. There's only a doorknob on the inside. In other words, Jesus is not going to barge his way in. And so we have to open the door of our life. And this was a church that needed Jesus to come in. In, uh, <clears throat> in Malachi chapter 3, verse 7, and you can kind of mark out that verse, 2 Timothy 4. I, I think that was a mistake. Malachi 3, 7, write that down. Malachi 3, 7 <clears throat> says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away in my ordin from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Return to me and I will return to you. As I think about the church of Laodicea, I think about how much we need to hear this message in America today. We need revival. And what does revival mean? It means to come to life again. It means to get that zeal back. And, and so many churches in America today, if, if you wanted to describe dead, lukewarm, apathetic, nobody wants to serve. That's what I hear from a lot of pastors. Nobody wants to serve. Nobody wants to do anything. They just want to show up, listen to a sermon, and go home. I mean, what is that? that? That's religion. That's not Christianity. It's not about just showing up and never wanting to serve. You can't be zealous for God and not want to serve. That, that, I mean, it, it, those two things don't equate. If you're zealous for God, you want to serve Him. You want to obey Him. You want to be a witness for Him. And so... In closing, what is your spiritual temperature? You don't have to answer that out loud, but I mean, what is it? Are, are, you, are you lukewarm? Boy, if you, if you have to say that, boy, I mean, I, I'm not going to re, re-preach this whole sermon to you, right? You don't need to hear it again. But if, if you're lukewarm, boy, this should be, you know, when I said that conviction that you know, you touch the, the stove and it's warning you that if you if you keep going and keep your hand, you're gonna get burned. Well, this this tonight is convicting. This is a convicting message, and it's it's convicting for a reason. And if we're lukewarm, this should be spiritual adjustments. There should be like, ooh, you know, I need to return to the zeal that I had for God. So that's the second question. Do you need to return to Christ with genuine zeal? Only you can answer that. Maybe you need to receive Christ into your heart. Maybe you say, you know what? I'm realizing I've never truly yielded my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's interesting. That last verse, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the last time you're going to read that in the book of Revelation. The next time you read that statement, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear. It doesn't say what the Spirit says to the churches. You want to know why? Because the church was taken. The rapture of the church happens before the seven years of tribulation. So we could be really close to the rapture of the church. We, nobody knows the day or the hour, but things are looking like it could be near. And, and what is the most important thing if we're near that is, is that you receive Christ into your heart. Jesus said, I'm, I stand at the door knock. Anyone opens the door, I will come into him. And so opening the door of your heart means that you turn from your sin, you put your faith in Jesus, you want to be baptized, you want to start growing in your faith. And I would love to help you do that. And... Uh, 
If you need to do that, uh, we can pray that prayer tonight. So let's pray together. And as we pray, and I'm just going to give you a moment to pray silently, and maybe you need to just say, God, don't let me be lukewarm. Father, please convict me and discipline me and, and renew the fire in my heart. Renew the fire. Give me zeal to be the kind of believer that I need to be for you. Maybe that's what you need to pray tonight. Father, I pray, God, for revival in the church in America today. God, so many churches, so many Christians are lukewarm. And Father, that's nauseating. And we need zeal. We need revival. We need to be bold in our witness. We need to work the work of, of, the, of the faith with joy. God, I pray that you would renew our zeal, relight the fire in our heart. Father, let that be in our church and let that be in churches throughout our land. And Father, for those that are not saved, that you're on the outside knocking on the door of their hearts. God, I pray that there would be a revival in our land where millions of people would realize their condition and they would open their heart and let you in. Because only you can bring peace. Only you can bring joy. Only you can bring true riches. Yet if you're here tonight and you, you realize that you need Christ or you're watching this and you realize that you need Christ, pray this with me. Dear Jesus, I need you. I don't want you to be on the outside of my heart. I realize that I'm a sinner and that only you can cover my sin. I realize that I am poor, I'm blind, I'm naked before you, and only you can open my eyes. And I pray tonight that you would come into my heart, that you would come into my life. I believe in you, that you died for me, that you rose from the dead. And right now, I want to commit my life to you. I put my faith in you. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you pray that and you need to let Jesus Christ come in your life, you, you, you want to talk to me about that, okay? Come see me. Say, hey, you know what? I've really made a commitment to Christ. And let me encourage you about baptism. Let me encourage you about how to grow. And um, let's, uh, let's just see what God's going to do in your life. Well, hey, guys. Enjoyed it. It's been a good study. The Letters to the Seven Churches. And we will... Look forward to uh, our Wednesday nights kicking back off in August. But we'll see you Sunday. All right? See you Sunday.